In January 2025, Donald Trump will officially become the President of the United States of America for a non-consecutive second time. Well, this is not a channel on politics, so let's stick to antinatalism and things around it. Let me say this at the outset, the antinatalism that we support on this channel, the ethical, philosophical antinatalism, more leaning towards Benetarian side is not going to be affected by Donald Trump's second election. Partly because the arguments don't need a politician or a billionaire for them to work and partly because hardly anybody cares about these arguments anyway. The Trump's election will have an impact on some of the peripheral issues of antinatalism, on the environment that is required for ethical antinatalism to even have a chance to sprout and also on pronatalism. Lawrence made a nice little video talking about how Trump's policies would help boost pronatalism. He talks about Trump's views on abortion, on the state-sponsored fertility treatments like IVF, on the kind of people that surround Trump like J.D. Vance and Elon Musk and their own pronatalist ideologies and projects like sending humans to Mars. This last part, by the way, sending humans to other planets deserves a video of its own because, I mean, it's a minefield of ethics. Anyway, Trump's policy document talks about pronatalism indirectly. Republicans will promote a culture that values the sanctity of marriage, the blessings of childhood, the foundational role of families, and supports working parents. We will end policies that punish families. It also refers to Trump's general opposition to late-term abortion. Abortion is a big deal in America. It is surprising that the most advanced nation our species has produced has problems giving women the choice to abort. But that's the reality we live in. Donald Trump is of the view that abortion should be left to the states instead of it being governed by the federal government. This in itself tells you how dissociated politics is from ethics and philosophy. In a statement dated 8th April 2024, Trump has said that my view is now that we have abortion where everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint. The states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both. The Guardian has an abortion tracker for the state of abortion laws in different states of America. On this map, the states shown in some shade of red color have some kind of abortion ban. Those four states states in grey are thinking about it and the rest green states have abortion as legal. It is a nice interactive chart where you can click on each state to know the details. They also have list of populations of women of reproductive age in each kind of state. This is all interesting on paper. You might think that okay, women might still travel to another state and get aborted if they want to. But it's not that easy. There are many details to consider. From even before the election, there has been a lot of anticipation on the impact on women's reproductive rights if Trump was elected. For example, this article by Guardian on 21st of October titled, If Trump Wins Election, This Is What Is At Stake, explains the nuances involved. In the states where abortions are banned, doctors doing abortions are at the risk of getting penalized or even jailed. At the same time, the law has to have some exceptions for the cases where where it is a medical emergency. But the article says, although these bans technically permit the procedure in emergencies, their exceptions are worded so vaguely that doctors across the country say it's not clear when they can legally intervene. Fearful of the criminal consequences of violating bans, doctors are forced to wait and watch as patients get sicker and sicker and then attempt to pull them back from the brink of death. And there's more to it. Trump has not made it clear whether he would or would not ban abortion nationally. But he does not have to. The Comstock Act of 1873 that criminalizes, among other things, shipping of abortion-related material is now getting some attention. Comstock Act is a federal law which has been used by anti-abortion lawyers in court arguments. This can be used to restrict access to things like self-abortion pills or equipment required to perform abortion. If Trump wishes to restrict abortion, he would not need a federal ban necessarily. The Guardian says, without ever involving Congress, Trump could use the Comstock Act to implement a nationwide de facto abortion ban. And if he doesn't, the courts could. Anti-abortion activists have begun to see lawsuits throughout the country that cite Comstock. While the Supreme Court's far-right justices Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito both brought up the 151-year-old law in recent arguments. This is the possible impact of Trump's election within the United States. But what about rest of the world? For that, we need to see who are his friends and what could be his foreign policy. It is no secret that Trump likes Vladimir Putin and Russia has been trying to 
ban child free content recently victor orban has been hungary's prime minister since 2010 and has implemented one of the most prominent pro netless policies in hungary while also using xenophobia to political ends i had made a video explaining how hungary spends more on pro netless policies than the amount that us spends on its military in gdp terms and prime minister of this country victor orban is a man trump likes victor orban one of the most respected men they call him a strong man he's a he's a tough person smart prime minister of hungary another example is georgia meloni who is friends with trump's friend elon musk georgia meloni is italian prime minister and is profusely in favor of state sponsored pro natalism whether these friendships will have any impact on the ongoing pro natalist policies in those countries needs to be seen but there are other ways in which trump's policies can impact people's decision to have children the word is tariffs to me the word, most beautiful word in the dictionary is tariff and it's my favorite word it needs a public relations uh... tariff is a tax that a government can collect of goods and services that are either imported into the country or exported out so for example if the us is imposing 10% tariff on imports of cars from japan then every time a car enters the us market from japan the us government collects a tax of 10% of the sale price of that car an article in al jazeera says trump would impose 10% to 20% tariffs across the board on all imports and 60% on imports from china he has also threatened mexico with 100% tariffs but at the same time it is expected that there will likely be exceptions for billionaires who supported trump including businesses like elon musk's tesla and tiktok hmm anyway trump's idea is that by imposing tariffs on imports it will incentivize companies to manufacture within the us rather than making things somewhere else and then shipping the end product to the us this in turn will create jobs for americans boosting its economy the higher the tariff the more likely it is that the company will come into the united states and build a factory in the united states so it doesn't have to pay the tariff that was from tariff wars are well covered in the media but what has this to do with anti natalism those who oppose tariff wars including kamla harris have stated that the cost that these companies have to pay for tariffs are ultimately passed on to consumers of those goods and services i mean where else will those companies bring the money from the higher the tariff the more likely it is to have them come into the, the higher the tariff the more you're going to put on the value of that piece those goods the higher people are going Ready? to pay in shops this will likely increase the prices triggering inflation and this will not just be in united states for two reasons one there will be reciprocal tariffs from other countries resulting price increases in their respective domestic markets and two if the inflation in the united states increases then federal reserve will have to start increasing the interest rates again if fed starts increasing interest rates then because us dollar is the world's reserve currency central banks in other countries will also have to follow the path increased interest rates can cause many detrimental effects like a technical recession or even a prolonged slowdown and so on now all of this is just a speculation i am not an economist so i can be very wrong in all of this analysis but this brings us back to the topic of having children increasing interest rates makes mortgages and loans costlier housing becomes costlier and so do other household expenses one of the many reasons in many surveys about why people are not having children has been financial take this pew research survey for example among adults under 50 who say they are unlikely to have children large majority see financial and lifestyle advantages to not being parents on the left hand side we have reasons for why people are not having children the gold bars show the percentage of us adults between the age of 18 and 49 who do not want children for the corresponding reasons as you can see 79% don't want children for financial reasons now this is a long multi dimensional chain of interconnected cause and effects and i'm not claiming that this will exactly turn out to be like this we might not even see the full effects if at all due during the period of trump's presidency nor am i saying that this is an ethical way of promoting antinatalism i am just pointing out one of the possibilities due to trump's tariff wars there is also a connection to actual wars trump has long complained that nato countries other than the us don't pay their fair share for ensuring security he has said that he would encourage russia to do whatever the hell they want to any nato country that doesn't pay enough one of the presidents of a big country stood up said 
Well, sir, uh, if we don't pay and we're attacked by Russia, will you protect us? I said, you didn't pay? You're delinquent? He said, yes, let's say that happened. No, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. You got to pay. You got to pay your bills. Trump has also blamed President of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, instead of Vladimir Putin for starting the war. I think Zelensky is one of the greatest salesmen I've ever seen. Every time he comes in, we give him $100 billion. Who else got that kind of money in history? There's never been. Mm. And that doesn't mean I don't want to help him because I feel very badly for those people. But he should never have let that war start. That war is a loser. Foreign policy of a country like the United States has to handle multiple conflicts at once and there are connections between them. We saw that Trump is focused on China for economic competition, which is why those extra tariffs on China. But there's also a Ukraine-like proxy war going on with China as well. This is happening through Taiwan and other countries around China like Philippines. So although Trump would impose tariffs on semiconductor goods from Taiwan, he will also have to maintain good relations with Taiwan for keeping Chinese expansion expansionism in check. At the same time, there are other alliances happening in the world. There is BRICS, which includes Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. One of the strategies for Trump would be to have strong relations with countries in BRICS other than China. Russia plays a key role in this too. A book by Pulitzer Prize winner Bob Woodward War published just before the elections alleged that Trump had as many as seven direct phone calls with Vladimir Putin after having left office after his first term. Trump has not rejected these allegations in direct terms. Can you say yes or no whether you have talked to Vladimir Putin since you stop being president. Well, I don't comment on that, but I will tell you that if I did, it's a smart thing. If I'm friendly with people, if I have a relationship with people, that's a good thing, not a bad thing in terms of a country. Another allegation which both Trump and Kremlin have denied is that Trump had directly sent COVID-19 testing machines during his first term while they were in short supply in the United States itself. The Wall Street Journal came out with a bombshell article, Elon Musk's secret conversations with Vladimir Putin, regular contacts between world's richest man and America's chief antagonist raise security concerns. Topics include geopolitics, business, and personal matters. The allegations in the article include a request by Putin to avoid Musk's Starlink internet service over Taiwan as a favor to Chinese leader Xi Jinping. So we can see some strategic reasons for Trump to be close to Putin. We also see some allegations made in this direction that are not outrightly rejected by Trump. We also see those close to Trump like Elon Musk being alleged of having close relationship with Putin. And oh, by the way, we haven't even mentioned that Tuckle Carlson was the only major Western journalist having been able to interview Putin recently, and a general lack of voices against Russia within Trump's arena. All of this gives us some hints of how Trump can end the Russia-Ukraine war as he has claimed many times during the campaign. The exact terms of the deal are difficult to guess, but it is not unreasonable to speculate that Trump would cut off full or partial aid to Ukraine, make Ukraine accept an unfavorable deal, giving Russia whatever territory has been invaded so far. Now again, what has this to do with antinatalism? Well, the war that Russia started thinking of ending it in three days has prolonged for just under two years until now. This has converted Russia into a wartime economy. Russia is hit hard in terms of human capital in this time. As it is, the fertility rates of Russia has been well below replacement levels and on top of that, it is fast losing young productive people either as war mortalities or through emigration with more and more people fleeing Russia. A channel called Joe Blogs explains in detail how Russia have lost more than half a million people since the start of January 2024. This table shows what's referred to as Russia's population clock. So if we start off by looking at Russia's current population of 144.7 million people, that's as of September 2024. Now in terms of the movement of population, there are three different factors that influence it. The number of births, the number of deaths, and what's happening with net migration, which is measured by looking at the number of people coming into the country, which is immigration, and the number of people leaving the country, which is emigration. So we start off by looking at births. The number of births per day currently in Russia is 3,478, and that compares to the number of deaths, which is 5,100, which means on a net basis, the population of Russia is reducing by 1,622 people every single day. But the situation is actually worse than that, because Russia is currently experiencing net emigration. More people are leaving, moving into the country, and the current rate of net emigration is 487 people per day. And when we include that figure, the number of people in Russia is reducing 
by 2,109 people every single day. And what that means is that since the start of January 2024, the Russian population has reduced by 533,577 people, which obviously represents a problem from an economic point of view because those people are no longer contributing to the Russian economy. As a result of all of this, Russia has been forced to bring in legislation to ban child-free propaganda and reward people having more children. Now, of course, having babies today is not going to help the ongoing war, but it will help Russian economy, which is struggling under the heavy sanctions put by the US. If Trump could get a deal to stop the war, despite the injustice that will be imposed on Ukraine and despite making the European NATO allies uncomfortable, it will relieve at least some of the pressure of Russia which is panicking about fertility rates today. Now, even if this happens, don't expect Putin to openly remove the child-free ban which is in the process of getting passed into a law. At the best, we can expect in a comparatively reduced hunger to enforce those laws in reality and a de facto space still open for conversations in the public mind. So we have some opposing situation here. The influence of pro-natalists and conservatives close to Trump could bring in some policies similar to that of Hungary for childbearing in the United States while also relieving some pressure off Russia. Now, of course, this is a very long-winded speculation on the effects, if any, of Trump's election on the current natalist sentiments. So is that a good news for antinatalism or not? Well, no, because there are nuances to consider. Antinatalism or even plain old child freedom needs a more liberal and progressive environment to germinate. It is no surprise that there is a strong inverted correlation between average number of children born per woman and the average level of women's education in general. As the level of education increases, the number of children per woman decreases. And although there have been academic evidences of antinatalism or at least some kind of proto-antinatalistic sentiments in certain religious sects in history, it is not clear how increasing religious and or conservative values in a society would allow, if not promote, any approach towards having fewer children. The Republican stereotype of gun-loving pro natal conservative with some shade of religious inclination exists for a reason. If Trump's election boosts the stronghold on Republican Party's values on the minds of ordinary Americans, it will be hard to imagine how any nuanced philosophy of ethics, let alone antinatalism, could thrive over there. As for the rest of the world, Trump Trump's ultra-transactional approach and tariff wars could spell a disaster. US has complex trade relationships with most of the nations on earth. Many of those nations depend significantly on trades that they do with United States. Imposing proper tariffs on goods that these countries send to the US would mean going through each trade nation by nation and within that commodity by commodity and deal by deal and designing a meticulously detailed tariff plan and then to maintain it on similar lines through an intricate machinery of diplomacy and processes. This will require a fine-tuned bureaucracy, but looking at the campaign rhetoric of cutting down on government bureaucracy and Elon's task of government efficiency and considering Trump's transactional approach without a strategic foresight of consequences, it is hard to imagine such a carefully constructed framework of tariffs to be available in Trump's administration. This will put many countries at risk of economic recession and they will become vulnerable to exploitation by adversaries of America like China, Iran or Russia and others. There would hardly be any chance then of furthering any progressive ideology, let alone child freedom or antinatalism. Going from Donald Trump to Dodo, the bird which went extinct in the 17th century was the starting point of a very interesting discussion on extinction by a channel called Overthink Podcast. The episode is roughly divided in three parts. The first part talks about extinction of animals and some concepts around extinction and how the possibility of extinction came to be recognized by the scientists in the first place and so on. Second part discusses to some depth the ideas in Todd May's new book Should We Go Extinct? And the third part gives very interesting information about de-extinction, which is a use of technology to bring back already extinct species and also creating whole new life forms with the help of genetic engineering. Talking of extinction, there is a webinar on extinction on 18th November at 2 p.m. Eastern and 7 p.m. UK time by Ben Ware, who is coordinator of Center 
of Philosophy at King's College, London. He would be talking to Kate Warlow Corcoran, and from the description, it seems like it is about Ben's recent book on extinction, beginning again at the end. The event is free with an option of donation of five pounds. I'll include the links in the description. The dissenter interviewed Julia Herman about something called as ectogestative technologies, or in simple words, artificial wombs. Artificial wombs can be partial or full. Partial in the sense that the fetus is inside the mother for some time before being transferred into a machine. Whereas full artificial womb is a machine where entire gestational development happens inside it. Even though full artificial womb is still a futuristic technology, the possibility raises a lot of ethical and philosophical questions. For example, bodily autonomy argument, which is a cornerstone of pro-choice movement for abortion, will be impacted by both full or partial artificial wombs. Then there are legal problems around claims to parenthood, philosophical conundrums around timings of the birth, and so on. From an antinatalist point of view, many aspects which don't seem as philosophically challenging in a normal course become a puzzle in case of artificial wombs. And finally, a good news that an antinatalist handbook compiled by Lawrence is now translated into Japanese language. That means the handbook is now available in 16 different languages.